Good morning. Welcome to the September 2016 edition of the City of Winston-Salem's Public Safety News Conference. My name is Trey Mayo. I'm the Fire Chief of the City of Winston-Salem. The order of presentation today will be fire, then emergency management, and then uh, City of Winston-Salem Police Department. First thing I'd like to do is recognize and remember uh, the uh, line of duty deaths that the City of Winston-Salem Fire Department has suffered during the uh, month of September. Fire Chief William Hobson was a 26th year veteran of the fire department when he suffered a heart attack and died on duty September 15, 1938 at Fire Station 2 and that was when that station was located on Liberty Street. Chief Hobson was well known as a firefighter's fire chief having begun his career with the department in 1912 and risen through the ranks before, becoming, uh, before being appointed fire chief in 1932. We do not have a picture of James Buck Bashirs. He was a 27-year veteran of the fire department. He died September 30th, 1986. He was assigned to Engine 10 and suffered a stroke while conducting a pump test at Salem Lake. And we also would like to remember our colleagues in Shelby, North Carolina, who uh, have lost a police officer in the line of duty this, this week. And also in Wink, Texas, Meridian, Mississippi, and Dakota City, Nebraska, uh, where firefighters have lost their lives in the line of duty uh, over the past week. Uh, these deaths continue to serve as a reminder of the dangers America's firefighters and police officers face every day uh, when going about their duties. If you will, uh, pause with me just a moment uh, to remember these individuals. Thank you. So I know you all are anxiously awaiting my monthly public safety announcement. Um, so this house uh, is located in Memphis, Tennessee. There was a fire in this house uh, Monday morning. Nine people died. There were 10 residents living in this house. Uh, the fire was started by an overloaded drop core supplying a window unit air conditioner. Uh, firefighters were able to, to, uh, to rescue and remove three occupants uh, unfortunately, two of those died uh, later at the hospital. There was one smoke alarm located, but it was damaged so badly by the fire, investigators were unable to determine if it was working at the time of the fire. This fire was not, uh, this house was not equipped with residential fire sprinklers. Um, so if, if you notice, if you look at this house, and, and I realize that, that you're a distance from it and the picture's not very large, but, uh, you know, because of the outstanding job that Hollywood and the 6 o'clock news has done training this family to fear crime, they had placed security bars on the doors and windows. Now, security bars, we can get them off, but it severely hampers our access uh, to a house when it's on fire, or any building for that matter, uh, and it makes it impossible for, uh, for occupants to escape except through doors. Now you can't, you can't tell it on this picture, but I, I blew this picture up on my computer and I could tell that that door on the left side of the house that is standing open, not only is it barred, but it is secured by a deadbolt that is keyed on both sides. Uh, and so even if occupants could have uh, made their way to that door, they could not have opened it they could not have unlocked that locked deadbolt if they had not had a key. So if you, know, if you look on the front, they've got a toy truck sitting there on the porch, so, and that's obviously undamaged by fire. That, that, truck was, that toy truck was sitting there before the fire started. So my question is, if you can leave a toy truck like that sitting on the porch all night, can you reasonably justify having bars on all your doors and windows? Um, so. You know, these folks essentially were going to sleep every night in a cage. This is just like being in prison uh, when you try to get out of there because of the doors, because of the bars on the doors of the windows, uh, doors and windows. Now there are houses just like this in the city of Winston-Salem, and this can and it will happen in the city of Winston-Salem. So what are the lessons to be learned? Well, be sure you have working smoke alarms on all levels of your house in every sleeping room, bedroom, and outside of all sleeping areas. Extension cords should be properly sized for the load they're carrying. 
and extension cords are not a replacement for permanent wiring. Extension cords are for temporary use only. <clears throat> Citizens should ensure that they have two routes of escape from every room. So if you've got barred windows, the window cannot be uh, a, a means of egress. So for those who have, uh, for, you know, for, for individuals out there who are listening to this, you need to be sure that all your windows are able to be easily opened, that they're not painted shut, and that you can easily open them from the inside if you need to use that window uh, for an escape route. In the modern fire environment, studies have proven that once a fire reaches a flame height of four inches, you have three and a half minutes to get out of your house before conditions become untenable due to heat and products of combustion. So, you know, people think they've got eight or 10 minutes to get out of a house. No, not since sometime in the 1970s have you had that much time to get out of a house because of what now is on fire in your house. If you have a, a two-story house, uh, there are products on the market that are escape ladders that can be used to evacuate uh, through the window when you are, uh, when that window is above grade. Don't use dead bolts that are keyed on the inside. The only difference between a residential door that, is, that is, has a dead bolt and is keyed on the inside and I'm wondering with a thumb latch is the amount of door frame you're going to have to replace in the unlikely event that somebody kicks it in. So that you are, you are, you are, you do not want to have to have a key to unlock a deadbolt when you need to get out of that house when the house is on fire. <clears throat> Next up for the fire department will be Captain John Suters. Captain Suters is going to discuss um, the epinephrine that we carry. There's been a lot of talk about epipens in the news lately, so we're going to tell you about the, epi the uh, epinephrine that the fire department carries. Uh, fire and Life Safety Educator Sabrina Stove is with us. Uh, she's going to talk about Fire Prevention Month activities. Uh, the month of October is always designated as Fire Prevention Month. And uh, Ms. Stowe will also talk about uh, activities that the fire department will be conducting uh, during the Dixie Classic Fair and also a, an October project for the fire department uh, where we will uh, deliver and install approximately 500 sets of stovetop fire stops in targeted areas in the city where we know the incidence of uh, uh, fires caused by unattended cooking are higher than the normal. Remember folks, the most dangerous thing in your house is your stove. 41% of the fires in America and 51% in the city of Winston-Salem start as a result of unattended cooking. Uh, I'll be back up uh, when, when uh, the police department comes up for some uh, citizen commendations. Uh, but until then, I would recommend, uh, remind you to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is uh, City of WS Fire on both of those social media sites. Captain Suters. <coughs> Good morning. I'd like to take the next few minutes and talk about allergies, anaphylaxis, and the use of epinephrine. Um, the chief spoke about the EpiPen being in the news lately. Um, this is a trainer. This is, doesn't have a, a needle or medicine, but this is what it looks like. Um, and some of the prices that were being charged. Uh, at the city of Winston-Salem, when we administer epinephrine, we use a multi-dose vial and we use a syringe. So. Normally these cost anywhere between 250 and I've heard prices as high as 600 in the news. Um, our multi-dose vial is five dollars and this vial we, we can give three adult doses or six child doses so we're getting quite a bang for our buck when it comes to that. Um, so what is an allergic reaction and simply put uh, an allergic reaction is an immune response by the body to a substance that it's been um, become hypersensitive to. All right, um, when it's severe, we call it anaphylactic shock. And <coughs> anaphylaxis is a life-threatening condition that needs to be treated right away. And, and what you would need is epinephrine or what's commonly known as adrenaline. They're the same thing. And adrenaline's a common substance in your body, so it's not like a chemical or anything that we're putting in. The key is call 911. 
um, or if you are subscribed, or I'm sorry, prescribed epinephrine, obviously you would have your EpiPens with you and that's what you would want to use. Some of the common triggers that everyone's probably really familiar with would be peanuts, shellfish, bees, penicillin, latex, pretty much anything that's not common to your body, dust, anything could be an allergen. It just depends whether or not your body becomes hypersensitive to it. Signs and symptoms, um, these are pretty important. Flushing of the skin, and the most common ones, you see there's a whole list there, but the most common ones that you'll see are rash, difficulty breathing, swallowing and speaking, and a drop in blood pressure. And when you get the difficulty breathing and the drop in blood pressure together, that's when it really becomes life-threatening. And those are things that you want to be able to recognize because um, it can go from being not that bad to being a life-threatening event pretty quickly. What is epinephrine? Like I said, it's a, it's a synthetic version of adrenaline, which adrenaline is a, a common substance in your body. If you've ever ridden a, a roller coaster and you got that feeling where you're like, you're breathing hard and you feel your fingers tingle and all, that's just your body dumping adrenaline into your, body, into your system. So that's the feeling you would get. Um, how is it administered? Normally in the pre-hospital, pre-first responder setting, you would use an EpiPen. Okay, and like I say, this is a trainer version. Um, there are two types. There's an adult that has a 0.3 milligram dose, and then there's a, a child which is a 0.15 milligram dose, and those are color coded, so uh, it's pretty hard to mistake the two. And like I say, with the, the child dose, it's green. That's for weights 33 to 66 pounds. And when I say child, we don't want to think in terms of age, you want to think in terms of body weight. So if they're between 33 and 66, they would get the pediatric dose, which is 0.15 milligrams. If they're over 66 pounds, regardless of age, they'll get the adult dose, which is 0.3 milligrams. And uh, as I said, normally in a pre-hospital setting, you're going to know that you're allergic to something, and you're going to have prescribed to you the EpiPen. And I think the biggest thing, if anyone doesn't know, there's tons of generic epinephrine or adrenaline on the market, but the EpiPen is the only auto injector on the market for epinephrine. That's why I think they're able to get away with, with charging the prices that they do. Um, how to use the EpiPen? The key is call 911 first, okay? If you start having, if you get stung by a bee, you start seeing a rash, your tongue starts to swell, you have trouble breathing, call 911, and then um, obviously, you know, if you are prescribed it, get, go to your EpiPen and get it ready. Um, like I said, this is a trainer. It doesn't have a needle or medicine in it. And simply put, there's like really three steps. You take, take it out of the package. You pull the blue safety cap off. Firmly hold it in your hand, whichever hand's dominant. It, it, I guess it doesn't matter which hand, really. And then on the outside of your leg, press it firmly till you hear the click. You hold it for 10 seconds, and then you remove it. And if you'll notice, the needle will get covered with this, so it's, uh, it's got safety mechanism built in. Um, and that's all there is to epinephrine um, and the use of the EpiPen. So um, it's important that, that if you have them, you know that. And this kind of leads me into the next thing. We really, as far as epinephrine goes, we, most people know they're allergic to, medicine, to, to whatever it may be, peanuts, bees, whatever. So they already have epinephrine. So it's not often that we, we really administer epinephrine. Right now we're averaging five to six times a year. You know, with like Narcan, we, we, it's probably, I, I would hazard a guess, 10 to 15 times more a year than we do epinephrine. Um, so if you have allergies and you know you have allergies, it's make sure you have these and carry these with you all the time. And are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Good morning, Sabrina Stowe, Fire and Life Safety Educator for the Fire Department. Today we're just going to talk about some of the things that we have coming up. Um, of course, as Fire Chief mentioned, October is Fire Prevention Month. We celebrate the Fire Prevention Week October 9th through 15th this year, but as a department, we like to take the entire month of September, excuse me, the entire month of October um, to highlight various 
fire safety and fire prevention things that we want to remind you of. The Dixie Classic Fair is probably the, the largest um, venue that we have that we um, try to get as much in as we can about Fire Prevention Month. Um, each year we do have a section at the fair located near the gate number two entrance. Um, there we have what we call Safety Town and we set up um, various courses and um, things that people can come to. All of our activities are free of charge. We do like to highlight our safety trailer where um, participants can go inside, learn about various safety things. We'll highlight some of the, um, the key messages that we like to get out. As Chief mentioned, knowing two ways out of um, any building. We smoke up that house to give people an idea of what it would be like if they are in a burning building or in their homes and to make sure that they are aware of how they can escape that environment. We're also um, going to go along with the um, NFPA's theme this year which is going to be talking about smoke alarms and of course that's our number one thing. It's the number one um, defense of fire in your home. So we're going to have a section there where people can come and learn how to test their smoke alarms. We're going to teach them how to check the dates on those to make sure that it hasn't extended the 10-year period. And we're also going to have an area where people that do not have smoke alarms in their homes, they can sign up to receive smoke alarms through the department's um, smoke alarm program, which we will install smoke alarms in the homes of individuals that need them at no cost. We're also going to have some demonstrations there, uh, one of which is going to be um, a residential sprinkler um, building that's going to show people the safety, um, the benefits of having residential sprinklers. We're also going to have the stovetop fire suppression devices there as well. And in the next slide, um, you'll see what those are. And it's just a canister or a set of canisters that goes over the cooktop of the stove. It will extinguish a fire that once the flame reaches that device, it's going to completely extinguish that fire. And that's one of the things that we are pushing um, out in the community and just making people aware that there is a device out there that can assist. Again, unattended cooking is the number one cause uh, for cooking fires. This is just an example of a, a save. Um, a, a home from a fire in April of this year. They had those devices in their home and this as you can see they pulled the stove out, they pulled the cabinets out and if you go to the next slide there this is just the result the after that fire had happened as you'll see there's very minimal damage to the wall some to the ceiling but there is no complete fire in the home that um, without that device probably would have consumed not only the kitchen but possibly the entire home. As our fire chief stated, the city has invested in these devices. We want to put about 500 of those into the homes and areas where we've seen um, an influx of kitchen fires. Um, we want to go out into those residences. We're going to do that in the month of October in high-risk areas. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that. The other thing we're going to be doing in Fire Prevention Month is we're going to be doing some community education outreach for our teachers any teachers that um, contact us to have um, our firefighters come out during the month of October for Fire Prevention Month. We have some special um, activity, um, educational um, worksheet packets for them. So any teachers that want to have us to come out, want to present that, they can just go to our website to schedule us to come out at cityofws.org slash fire program or they can contact our community education office 336-773-7965. Um, Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Good morning. I'm Mel Sadler, <coughs> Director of Emergency Management for the City of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County. Um, on this past Sunday, November the, September the 11th, our nation commemorated the 15th anniversary of the largest terrorist attack on, on our country in history. 
The commemorations were in the form of a number of efforts, uh, ranging from the reading of the victims' names in various locations to the 9-11 Public Safety Challenge that was held here in Winston-Salem on Saturday, September the 10th. Traditionally, September the 11th is considered to be a day of service, with many persons volunteering a day of service to their community. We hope that our citizens will continue to honor this tradition and make necessary efforts to serve our community in, volunteer, in a volunteer capacity and not just limit that volunteer capacity or volunteer effort to one day per year, but every day we need volunteers. September has also been designated <clears throat> as National Preparedness Month, and we urge our citizens to review their past efforts at preparedness or to begin new preparedness efforts in order to protect your families against the effects of disasters. Leah Cordell, an emergency management coordinator in our office, is here today to introduce to some and to refresh the memories of others regarding what preparedness information is available to aid your effort in preparedness. Good morning. As mentioned, it, September is uh, National Preparedness Month and Emergency Management is doing several um, promotional um, information to get out to people to encourage everybody to communicate and make emergency plans today. Um, some of the things we're doing is um, every day throughout the month of September we're doing daily posts. That, uh, uh, we have weekly topics. Uh, we've already covered basic preparedness. Last week was flood safety. Uh, this week is power outages, next week's fire safety, and uh, the week after that would be severe weather. And every Friday we're having a trivia challenge uh, question. So the first person that answers the question goes to Facebook on our Ready for Scythe Facebook page and answers the question correctly has an opportunity to win uh, emergency weather radio. So some of the things that we're promoting throughout the month of September as well as every day of the year. Um, preparedness tips. Make a family plan a 72 and assemble a 72-hour uh, kit for every member of the family. Uh, make a communication plan so everybody uh, knows where to go in the event of emergency and how to get in touch with each other um, after an emergency and how they can get back together afterwards. Uh, flood safety tips. 90% of all disasters in the U.S. involve flooding. A flood watch uh, is rainfall, means he rainfall is heavy enough to cause rivers to overflow their banks. Flooding is possible. A flood warning means flooding is already occurring in the affected area. Standard homeowner insurance does not cover uh, flood insurance, so we encourage everybody to purchase flood insurance in addition to your standard homeowners association or homeowners association uh, policy. Don't forget um, when you see water in the in the roadway turn around don't drown just a small amount of water can cause a car to be uh, swept away. Power outages, um, make sure everybody in your household, uh, every household has an emergency uh, radio with same uh, technology, same means specific area message encoder technology, and they are programmable to receive areas, um, warning alarms to selected individual counties. And don't forget to never use a generator or gas grills indoors, carbon monoxide kills. For fire safety, make sure everybody, um, you have a, a plan to get out of the building and that everybody knows how to get out. As uh, Chief Mayo said, every uh, room needs to have two exits. Um, make sure your family has working smoke detectors. That's very important. Severe storm safety, any thunderstorm can produce strong winds, lightning or hail that can be damaging know what to do and where to go when severe strikes in your area. Lightning can strike as far as 10 miles away from a rain area and thunderstorm. That's about the distance you can hear thunder when, when a storm is 10 miles away 
it may be difficult to tell a storm is coming. If the sky looks threatening, seek shelter immediately. Don't forget the 30-30 rule. Go indoors if after seeing lightning you cannot count to 30 before hearing thunder. Stay indoors for 30 minutes after hearing the last clap of thunder. Also, don't forget to add um, the Ready for Scythe web app to your mobile home screen. And don't forget to like us on uh, on all our social media so you get updated information regularly. You can also uh, download the Ready NC app and you get all kinds of good information on um, preparedness. And for further information, uh, you can contact our office at 767-6161. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> okay, if nobody has any questions, I'll introduce Chief Roundtree. Good morning. Good morning. Now, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department for what you do every day, all your hard work and dedication in serving the citizens of Winston-Salem. Today we'll start with our officers' remembrance before we get into our topics. Today we want to remember and honor Patrolman Charles Kennard. Patrolman Al Charles Kennard, end of watch, Saturday, September the 9th, 1961, cause of death, motorcycle accident. The date of the incident was September the 9th, 1961. Incident details, Patrolman Kennard was killed in a motorcycle accident while he was on patrol. The motorcycle left the roadway and struck a curve at a light pole, killing him instantly. Patrolman Kennard's death also led to new rules mandating helmets. Let us all pause for a moment of silence as we remember and honor Patrolman Kennard, as well as Police Officer Tim Bracken of the Shelby, North Carolina Police Department, who died on Monday, September the 12th, 2016. And all the officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty while serving in the month of September. Let us all pause for a moment. Thank you. Our topics for today will include uh, citizen accommodation, citizens' accommodations, as well as uh, Medal of Merit presentations to several police op to several police employees. That will be followed by the gang unit, Sergeant Doss and also drowsy driving by motor officer Spicer. The, the citizen accommodation and the Medal of Merit will be presented by me and Chief uh, Mayo of the Fire Department, and also the Medal of Merit presentation will be presented by me. Uh, I'm going to now ask Captain Jeff Watson to co come forward, who will provide the details of the incident. Good morning. Prior to the presentation, uh, we would like to present just a, uh, a brief narrative of the events that unfolded and led to the actions of both the citizens, uh, the Good Samaritan citizens, as well as our officers. On September 6, 2016, at approximately 6.47 a.m., a call came into our 911 center regarding a motor vehicle crash involving a school bus and a Ford F-150 pickup truck at North Cherry Street and Polo Road. There were reports of injuries with this incident. Therefore, both officers, fire department, and EMS were dispatched to the scene. Due to the crash severity, the vehicles became intertwined and a fire erupted in the engine compartment of the pickup truck. Because of the damage to the pickup truck, the driver, Mr. Terry Wayne McCarney, Jr., was entrapped in the burning vehicle. Approximately the same time, a uh, citizen 
reported to one of our officers, Corporal James Gerald, who was approximately a mile away from the incident, reported that the incident had occurred. Therefore, Officer Gerald uh, self-responded as the <coughs> incident was being dispatched. Although he was a mile from the scene, prior to arrival, he could see the smoke already billowing from the vehicle. Not knowing the full details from the citizen, uh, he was not prepared for what he uh, encountered. Upon arrival, uh, he began to take actions, including fire suppression efforts and requesting additional officers to respond to the scene in order to perform rescue efforts as well as fire suppression efforts until the fire department could arrive. This time of the day is rather unique for the agency. It's our overlap period. We had members of the agency from both midnight shift as well as our day shift and specialized units that were on duty and responded to the scene. A total of seven officers uh, responded. Additionally, there were three citizens that were uh, en route or commuting to work at that time. Uh, these citizens were all in the vehicle together, uh, driven by Mr. George Rogers, who is one of the citizens that uh, we were recognized this morning. They become involved and uh, immediately uh, ran to the to the rescue uh, to the efforts of the rescue. Uh, in addition, Mr. Rogers utilized his pickup truck and pulled uh, the victim's pickup truck away from the bus. Now, this was done in order to to accomplish two missions. Number one was to be able to better suppress the fire. And number two was to be able to get to the driver's side door of uh, Mr. McCarney's vehicle to better uh, rescue him from the vehicle. At this time, I would like to show a video that was captured on an officer's head camera of the scene. Get the door. 
As you saw from the video, the, the officers and good Samaritans who responded to the aid, of, the aid of Mr. McCarney worked as a team in a concerted effort. It was clear without the continuous fire suppression efforts, the vehicle would have quickly become engulfed in flames. Dedication, selfless acts of the heroism displayed by both the officers and the good Samaritans no doubt saved the life of Mr. McCarney. A couple of members of his family are here today you'd like to step forward, Chief Roundtree, Chief Mayo. Mr. McCarney is uh, currently recovering from injuries from the uh, incident at the hospital, so he's unable to be here today. If I could get Mr. Uh, George Rogers, Mr. Anthony Huffin, Mr. Chris Owens to step forward. Mr. Rogers, for your actions, and as Chief of Police, I do want to present you with a Chief of Police Citizen Commendation. I want to thank you for everything that you did that day to help out and to save the uh, person who was trapped in the car. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. also that reads, you hereby recognize and applauded, <coughs> applauded for your quick and decisive emergency actions to assist in the rescue of your fellow citizen on September 6, 2016. Uh, this is just further proof that uh, you know, we can't be everywhere all the time and we, we depend on uh, folks like you who can think and act in an emergency and we certainly appreciate it. Congratulations. Thanks, sir. So I asked Mr. Chris Owens. I also want to thank you as well. And you have a Chief of Police Citizen Accommodation. And it reads, for your unselfish acts and life-saving efforts in assisting WSPD in rescuing a citizen that was trapped in a vehicle as a result, as a result of a traffic crash. So I also want to thank you, too, on behalf of uh, all the members of the Winston Police Department what you did that day. Thank you, sir. All, all three of ours say the same thing, so mm -hmm. I'll present this to you and, uh, and uh, also uh, express our appreciation on, on behalf of the fire department for the efforts you made on that day. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony Huffin. <coughs> on 
all right today? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I also have a chief of police accommodation for you, and it reads the same. So I want to thank you on behalf of all the women and men of the police department for what you did to assist them that day, and also for assisting a citizen in need. So congratulations to you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. All right, guys, from the fire department, thank you and congratulations. Thank you, sir. If I get the involved officers to go ahead and start making your way up front. Yes. Corporal James Gerald, if you will step forward. These are metal of merit accommodations for all the police officers. So I just read one certificate, they read the same. This one is for Corporal J.B. Gerald, and it reads on September the 9th, 2016, you perform with exceptional courage and judgment that prevented the possible lawful loss or life or serious injury. Therefore, as police chief and on behalf of the police department, I commend you for your heroic actions. So thank you and congratulations to you. Officer G.S. Amaya. Have a certificate for you as well, and also a medal. Congratulations to you, sir. <laughs> Officer E.W. Boyles. Officer Stephen Everhart. <laughs> Officer Ryan Rendleman. <laughs> Officer Aubrey Sawyer. Officer Cody Robertson was, uh, was on vacation, is unable to be here today. Uh, his supervisor will be accepting his award. Next for the police department, we ask Sergeant Doss to come forward. Good morning again. My name is Sergeant Scott Doss. I am the supervisor of the gang unit here at the police department. I'm here to give a brief overview of the gang unit's functions and responsibilities. Uh, a little background here, the unit was formed in 2006, currently consists of a sergeant three corporals and six officers. We have one officer assigned to the FBI Safe Streets Task Force and one officer assigned to Homeland Security Investigations as task force officers. Both of those two task force focus primarily on gang investigations. Here's our list of our primary, primary responsibilities. We conduct investigations involving gangs, gang activity, gang members, street level crimes for intelligence and enforcement purposes. We focus on identification of gangs and gang members here in Winston-Salem. One of our most important roles is we conduct gang awareness training through our community. These sessions are available to groups such as neighborhood watch groups, churches, teachers, faculty, local schools. Uh, during these awareness sessions, we provide a lot of tips on how to recognize if gang activity may be going on in your neighborhood, or you may be able to recognize individuals that may be a part of a gang. These classes are free and available upon request. At the end of my presentation, I put up my name and 
phone number for any group wishing to have one of these sessions. This is probably the most commonly question that we get here at the gang unit. What is a gang? So this is your explanation. There's actually a North Carolina general statute that spells out what a gang is. Any ongoing organization, association, or group of three or more persons, whether formal or informal, having as one of its primary activities the commission of a felony or violent misdemeanor offenses or delinquent acts that would be felonies or violent misdemeanors if committed by an adult and having a common name or common identifying sign, colors, or symbol. So that's nice and long, but this is what way we break it down here. So what do you look for in a gang? Three or more persons committing felonies or violent misdemeanors and they have a common name, sign, symbol, or colors. That's what we consider a gang. I would like to mention quickly, we do have a gang steering committee here in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County. It's made up of three action committees. Of course, I'm on the law enforcement committee. We have a group of clergy and a group that uh, focus on intervention and prevention. This committee is led by our own community relations specialist, Ms. Pam Peoples Joyner. Her number is included. This group meets regularly uh, and we, it's designed to uh, send referrals for kids, boys and girls wanting to get out of gangs to get them employment and other type of uh, resources to get out of the gang lifestyle. I also wanted to mention real quickly, I actually brought it along with me. The uh, gang unit was recently awarded uh, the Gang Unit of the Year Award by the North Carolina Gang Investigators Association. We received this last, year, last month at our yearly conference. Conference is a well attended conference with over 700 officers present. So uh, it was a high award, uh, quite an honor for the department to get. Um, and I'd like to also mention this is the second time we received this award. We got it back in 2011. That's my name and information uh, along with my contact information. Are there any questions? If not, I'd like to introduce Motor Officer Paul Spicer for the next presentation. Good morning, my name is Motor Officer Paul Spicer of the Winston salem Police Department Traffic Enforcement Unit. Um, I have a real sleeper of a subject to talk about here. Um, it's going to be the driving tip of the month, drowsy driving. The, one of the common things at this time of year is the days are getting shorter, daylight's getting shorter, so for a, a simple driving tip of the month, it's going to be on drowsy driving. Crashes caused by drowsy driving often exhibit a set of common factors. Although sleepiness can affect all types of crashes during the entire day and night, drowsy dri driving crashes mostly frequently occur between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, or in the late afternoon, both times when there are dips in your circadian rhythm, that's the internal human body clock. Your body knows when it needs sleep and it wants it then. It's not going to wait. And that's why it gives you all kinds of um, clues that, that you need to have some rest. Who is at risk? No one is immune. The following groups are at the highest risk based on evidence from crash reports that have been obtained and self-reports or sleep behavior and driving performance. Basically, young drivers between 17 and 23 year old are the highest risk, mainly males. Um, why not 16 year olds? When people usually first get their license, they're very aware. They try to be very proactive in their driving. So that's why it jumps to the year 17. Um, people with sleep disorders such as sleep apnea, insomnia, restless leg syndrome, or narcolepsy keeps them from having a good night's sleep. Uh, shift workers who work at night, who, are, who work long or irregular hours, and people who sleep less than six hours per night. Um, also, this time of year is when allergies start kicking up. People start taking antihistamines and other uh, products over the counter that also affects your sleeping. Uh, it also makes you drowsy, so be very aware of those um, of those over-the-counter medications before you take them. That is a bad picture, but it's one that some people see while driving, unfortunately. Many drowsy, drowsy driving crashes also involve only a single vehicle with no passengers besides the driver, running off the road at a high rate of speed with no evidence of braking. Um, if you don't have someone in a vehicle on a long trip, no one to talk to, no one to keep your interest up, you become a uh, very focused on one thing and that's driving but it's not the kind of focus that we need it's the it's the ones that you get real sleepy 
And there are no braking in some of these crashes, and they're usually high speed on long stretches of road that are very boring to drive. That's why the, the state has come up with the rumble strips on the side of the roads. I'm sure everybody's ran over one sometime or another. That's what they're there for. They're not for, uh, not an alarm clock. They're there to warn you that you are not staying in your lane. You need to pay better attention. We do have the time change coming up in November, and that should be November 6th. And while falling back gives us an extra hour of sleep and more light, when we get up in the mornings, all good things, the end of daylight savings can also create driving hazards, as in driving home in the evenings. After, um, after work, a long shift, you've got to go pick up the kids. Whatever you may do, the, you're losing daylight, so it's going to be a little longer during the day, and that can also be a time that you'll be very sleepy or, or um, be drowsy. We have everyday factors that, um, that affect this. You have work which you all put in long shifts, sometimes longer than others. You have school, which you have uh, teenagers, college students who have grown ups going back to school that do school work all night. And you also have people that have work and school. I had a, a crash the other night with a lady who was working two jobs and going to school. She didn't have time to sleep. Well, that's, that's not a good excuse. You need to always have your a good night's rest. You also have uh, social factors. Of course, we know what these are. You want to go blow off some steam after work or after a long week, and you stay out too late. Um, you have family factors, which are if you have small kids, especially new babies, they um, probably do not allow you to sleep a whole lot. So that'll also be, be another factor. And then stress. Stress will have the probably the most significant on you because of everybody has it, and it will not allow you to have a good night's sleep. We have great new technologies in the automobile industry. You have autonomous automobiles, which are the ones like a Google car or some of the other automobile manufacturers that are come up with a car that drives itself. You have the automatic brake detection system. You have lane change assist, lane departure warning systems, and night vision with pedestrian detection. All those are great advances in technology of the, of the, motor, of the motor industry. But advances in technology should not take place of paying attention. That's the number one thing. Get a good night's rest, pay attention, because most of the people that we come in contact with is like, what was, you focus, what was you focusing on, or can you tell me what you were doing at that time? They can't remember because they were not paying attention. Facts and stats, the National Highway Traffic, Traffic Safety Administration conservatively estimates that 100,000 police reported crashes are the direct result of driver fatigue each year. 60% of adult drivers say that they have driven a vehicle while feeling drowsy in the past year. Drowsy driving results in an estimated 1,550 deaths, 71,000 injuries, and $12.5 billion in monetary losses each year. Drowsy driving represents 10 to 30 percent of all crashes, and there are no tests for drowsiness before driving. Like, um, like driving after consuming alcohol where you have an alka sensor, unfortunately there is nothing that we have at this time that can tell us how drowsy you are while driving. Um, that basically comes from people that report that self-reported, uh, telling us that you were sleepy at the time, uh, and most of them, like I said, weren't paying attention, so they were like, I missed my turn or something, or I, I did something I, I wasn't planning on doing. The conclusion is adults should get a recommended seven to eight hours of sleep per day. It, they do have a thing, it was a test where they tested humans that after 18 hours of, of being awake, that's almost equivalent to a .05 on the Alka sensor. Okay, after being up 24 hours straight, that comes up to a 1.0 on the Alka sensor. .08 is legally drunk. So if you've been up for 24 straight hours, then, um, then that's almost like driving wild intoxicated. So, so always be you know, aware of what you're doing, how much rest you need, and how much uh, you'll need in the future. Um, Watch for signs you're not getting enough rest, which fatigue, of course, your moodiness. Moodiness comes from a very irritable road rage and also speeding, weight gain, and concentration or memory problems. And that becomes um, an instance where you can't remember exits that you've gone by and you can't remember the last couple of miles. Thank you for that. Is there any other questions on drowsy driving? Thank you. Okay.
Okay, those are all the topics that we have from the police department. Any questions on the police department's topics? Okay, any questions for any of the other presenters, fire department or either emergency management? Okay, at this time we'll conclude the press conference. Thank you for coming.